Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by ShareFile from Citrix, secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click on the microphone, and enter twist for a free 30-day trial. And by AWS Activate. It's easy to start and scale your business with Amazon Web Services. Check out free resources like one-on-one office hours with AWS Solutions Architects and much more. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, our news roundtable edition on the program today. Tony Hale from Chartbeat, a great entrepreneur with great insights into web metrics, and Danny Sullivan, legendary journalist, editor-in-chief and owner of Search Engine Land. It's going to be an amazing program. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's me, Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the program where we talk about technology startups, angel investing, you get it, um, and this... Uh, week. I have two amazing, amazing guests. Tony Hal from Chartbeat is with us. Tony, when was the last time you were on the program? I guess two or three years ago? Like, yeah, like 2010 or something like that. Wow. 2000, uh, yeah, 2010, 2011, something like that. I think 2010. And ba- back then you had three or four people at Chartbeat? Yeah, pretty much. There was three of us. We had like two desks okay. uh, and we were just stuck in the corner of a, of a big office. Yeah, uh, and now, uh, give us the update. How many people work at Chartbeat? Uh, we are about 70 people now. 70? Yeah. So from three or four to 70, and uh, full disclosure, I think I was the first angel investor in Chartbeat, or at least that's what you I were. demanded of you. Or was one yes, of the first. You, were, you, you were very persistent. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I take it my investment is doing well. Chartbeat is doing well, from what I understand. I don't have all the details. So. How many clients? Yeah. I mean, 70 employees, obviously, you must have you know, like decent revenues and all that kind of stuff, but how many clients and who are the big clients over there? So we have, uh, so we've got about 4,000 uh, customers across about 35 countries around the world, but if you want to think about the big clients, we have about 80% of the top publishers. So pretty much every time you go to a, a news or a sports or entertainment site, they're usually running Chartbeat these days. Got it. Uh, all right, fantastic. And then with us, of course, Danny Sullivan of Search Engine Land and Marketing Land. Danny, how are you? Doing good. How are you doing? Good. Welcome back. And uh, I see you've got the little Twitter bird on your shoulder. Yeah, I guess it probably is on my shoulder. That, the that Mr. Way. Blue Bird on my shoulder. What Disney song I had is never thought of that before. Yeah, Mr. Blue Bird on my shoulder. Very good. Song of the South. Song of the South. Song of the South. All right. Well, let's get right into it here. Uh, and I'll just make a quick mention at the top of the program. If you want to be on the secret mailing list with the super fans of the program. Now, this program's five years old. 100,000 people listen to every episode. Yada, yada, yada. 250 people are on twistlist.co, T-W-I-S-T-L-I-S-T dot C-O. Twistlist.co is the secret back channel where we talk about all things this week in startups and entrepreneurship. Anyway, let's get right into the news. Yahoo wants to become the default search on the iPhone. Kara Swisher scoops up internal sources at Yahoo about this, and uh, they're gearing up apparently to have a big pitch to Apple, and Johnny Ive know each other pretty well, Uh, Marissa and Johnny Ive know each other pretty well, according to sources. No formal presentation has been done yet, and Danny wrote about this, um, saying there would be no way for Apple to ditch Google search. Danny, why? Uh, well, the biggest challenge is that Yahoo doesn't actually have any search technology to be pitching. You know, they gave all that up as part of their deal when they signed this deal with Microsoft. And so supposedly in a period of three to four months, Yahoo would have to put everything back together that they used to have. and. It's not completely impossible that they could do it, but it's a huge challenge, especially when you consider that when Microsoft decided they wanted to get build search technology, it was a years-long process that they went through. And this is because Um, Yahoo famously didn't sell to Microsoft and they were trying to buy it, and they did this kind of weird deal where all of Yahoo's searches are actually Bing now, right? That's right. I mean, you know, if you recall, I think it was around 2008 that actually 
Microsoft wanted to buy Yahoo. Yep. Yahoo didn't want to be bought, and so then tried to do a deal with Google, which the U.S. Justice Department said, "No, no, you can't do that. Yeah. That would that would ruin competition." So a year later, <laughs> when when the only choice was left that Microsoft uh, was out there, they did another deal, and this time it went through, and and they gave up all their search technology. So when you search at Yahoo, by and large, you're really just getting Bing's re search results. They're dressed up a little bit here and there. There's some other stuff that's injected, but it's really Bing. And Yahoo had at the time, really good search technology, this Yahoo Boss engine and all these APIs. What actually do you know happened to all of that infrastructure that Yahoo had? Did they maintain that infrastructure or just turn it off? Uh, it's unclear to me. Um, some of that stuff was supposed to be licensed out to Microsoft. I mean, technically, Microsoft has a 10-year license on all that technology. Right. And so, you know, when the deal is up in another six years, they might hand it all back to, to Yahoo, which would be sort of like handing a Model T back to everybody when we're driving, you know, uh, Teslas. Yeah. So, but, you know, I, my impression is that most of that has just been mothballed, that, it, you know, you have to keep updating everything, right? I mean, right. Google last year rewrote their entire search engine. So, you know, even if they still had it, it it's just become outdated. Yeah, that quickly. Okay, Tony, uh, I'm switching over to you. How important is search in today's world when most of the sites out there, are, or at least the sites that are growing, seem to be getting more traffic from social and apps than from search engines today? So, if it's, And so is that true, what I just said? Yeah. So looking across the network, Google is still the, the big driver of traffic. If you look across the, the Chopping network, then we see that Google is still driving about 36% of referral traffic. Okay. Um, you see Facebook driving about 16%. So it's, it's a significant amount, but it's nowhere close to Google just yet. And Twitter's down there. They're at kind of 2.6%. So that's obviously for different sites, they have very, very, there's a lot of variance within that. Yeah. But Google is still incredibly important. It's still very often the number one uh, referrer for yeah. most of these sites as well. But hasn't, I mean, so yeah, certainly Facebook is half the amount or less, and then Twitter. So if you put Twitter and you know, Facebook together, it would be half the amount that Google is sending across the Chartbeat Networks data. Yeah. But that um, traffic, used to come from Google, correct? Like I, can't speak to, yeah. I, I can't speak to where it, where it used to come from right. uh, on this front. No. Uh, what, I, what I can say, obviously, is that the growth in kind of Facebook and, uh, and, and Twitter traffic has been significant. Uh, uh, but I, I, you can't write off the, the value of search in this thing. I think the Yahoo, the Yahoo point is, is kind of interesting, though. I was actually at Yahoo yesterday uh, at Sunnyvale, and... One of the things that I, I, I noticed about there is that everyone I spoke to uh, had been had come from a startup that was recently acquired or had been acquired in the last year or so, and they're building a tremendous amount of talent uh, back up into Yahoo. And one of the interesting things for me is when Alibaba goes public here, and the word on the street is that Marissa will try to keep as much of that money within Yahoo as possible right. and use that to go on a massive buying spree. And so I don't know whether they're going to make this, uh, whether they're going to be able to get the search off, uh, off of Google for, app, uh, for Apple, right. but they're going to be doing something interesting with that cash as they go forward. Danny, is there a chance that the new head of Microsoft says, maybe we don't need to be in the search engine business. We give Bing to Marissa for a bunch of cash that she got from Alibaba, and we just go deeper into enterprise. Um, you know, it's possible, and that was one of the rumors when we thought it was Elop that was going to come in. Yeah. Um, but I really don't think so, and I think it's even less likely now that you've had the Cortana rollout, hmm. because Cortana is so closely tied to Bing and having search and explain keeping what this it kind is. of information. Yeah, explain what it is. Cortana is Microsoft's version of Google Now. Yeah. I'd say it's Microsoft's version of Siri, but it's much more closer to Google Now, and that is building up interest profiles about you, trying to predict information and what you need and what you want going forward. And so to do that, that's really a search function, and mm. you want a search engine that goes with it. So for them to give up Bing, they're going to give up some of the back end that's powering what's sort of the heart of them pushing out this new smartphone that they hope people will start using. I just don't see them doing that. And you were the, one of the first people to use this product. You've tested it, correct? What is it like? 
Uh, yeah, I'm running it right now. Um, it's pretty cool. It's not like Google Now where it, it's doing as much of the predictions that, that Google Now can do. It still has a lot of learning to, to pick up. But, um, you know, it's it has interesting things where you can have, say, reminders that are set for you when you're in certain places huh. um, or when you're interacting with certain people. If I was going to, say, uh, give you a call or you called me, a little reminder might come up to tell yeah. me to say, oh, don't forget to mention, you know, we're supposed to get together or something like that. So, um, but, you know, I think it's, it's really remarkable to me that they've kind of got some of the foundation to do what Google Now does. And if yeah. anybody's used Google Now, it, you know, I mean, I, this, this is my 18th year, actually, coincidental, it's my 18th year of covering search today, my anniversary, right? right? So I'm pretty jaded about search stuff. Yeah. And this is going to change your life and everything. And Google Now is one of those things that I went, wow, this is, this is very transformative. Yeah. Uh, and so this gives them the ability to do that sort of thing. Do, can people tell the difference or will be people be able to tell the difference if you were to put, let's say, Bing, search, into the iPhone and stripped out the, um, the logos and the branding and put Google, Google's product and Bing's product in there. Do you perceive that consumers would be able to tell the difference? And if so, what would be the differences they would be able to tell? They probably wouldn't. In fact, I this week I switched my default yeah. over to Bing just to so I could keep fueling stuff into Cortana. And it's been right. funny because there are times that I, I go and I think, oh, I'm not on Google. And I've had to do a, yeah. a second take because everything looks so similar and right. and so the the results aren't 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 bad you 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 might not notice at all and if and if apple were smart what they would do is they would roll out siri search right ah. so you would go to safari you would do a search and your search results would come back from siri mm -hmm. where they would do the the primary stuff that they do already yep. and if you didn't get the answers then you would get your answers it would come back from siri search powered by bing or whatever um but the danger is that if it stumbles, I think people will react to that much more badly than they would if Google stumbled. I think that if you have a long time relationship with your search engine like Google and it, and it doesn't come back to you, uh, sometimes you may want to blame yourself, right? Yeah. Oh, I just didn't search right. To whereas if you realize, wow, they shifted over to Bing, I don't want Bing. What's, right. That's why I'm not getting all this good stuff, even though you know the same thing might have happened on Google. All right, when we get back from commercial break, um, I want Tony to tell us which are the sites, which are the brands that have leveraged and switched over, actually changed from Google being their primary referrer to uh, social being their primary referrer, and what impact that's having on the industry. When we get back from this very important message, and this very important message is from my friends at New Relic. You know, I have all this ad copy here I could read. Or I could just tell you a very simple story, which is I launch inside.com, right? You guys know the story. I'm a 20 year vet of making content and building distributed workforces to curate stuff. I've been doing it my whole career for better or worse. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Anyway, I'm on my latest project inside.com. I launch it. It's got all kinds of technical problems. Uh, it's slow and nobody can figure out why it's slow. Is it our CDN? Is it our servers? Is it the code? Uh, is there something in the app that's a problem? And we're, we're dealing with you know, I don't want to say finger pointing, the team is very collaborative, but the whole team is like, well, my code looks good over here, and, and this seems to be okay over here. It's just very difficult to diagnose what's going on in the very complicated, multi-layer, multi-vendor environments that we're building on, these startups that we are all building. And so I throw up a flare, boom, the bat signal goes up, New Relic help me. New Relic says, hey, J-Cal, we got your back. And they give me all the licenses and software I need. Boom, I put it on our stack. And like the hand of God, boop, they find the problem in like literally minutes. This piece of code in Ruby is the offending piece of code. What's the piece of code? It's the voting in the app, voting stories up and down, you know, a la Reddit and Dig. And it turned out when you were swiping, for some reason, just like an edge case, nobody's fault, no, nobody to blame really in our company, it was firing off votes. And people were so addicted to the product and they're swiping like maniacs. So then the votes start piling up and the database servers go mm, Anyway, New Relic saved my ass. If you wanna thank New Relic for sponsoring independent media like this, there's two things you need to do. Number one, you need to go and sign up for newrelic.com slash insights. Um, 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go to newrelic.com slash twist. Newrelic.com slash twist. T-W-I-S-T. You'll get a free T-shirt if you sign up. No credit card. Super fast, super easy. So go there and sign up and just try New Relic. That's all I'm asking. If you're, in, if you're building a startup, just try New Relic on your servers. Ask your sysadmin, ask your, your DevOps to do that. And then number two, just go ahead and say thank you at New Relic on Twitter for saving at Jason's ass. Um, <laughs> they really did a good job of helping me. And it's the biggest endorsement I can give is that we use the product. And as you guys know, it's a white, this is white listed advertising and partners on this program. That's why our ads are sold out for six months in advance. I'm, I'm bragging a little bit. But we only let people advertise and support this show if we use their actual product. So New Relic, I can give my 100% greatest um, re uh, recommendation that you use it. And, you know, listen, if, you, if, you, if my recommendation is not enough, how about Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, and AT&T? Incredible. Okay, uh, let's get back to the program. Tony, what sites um, have crossed over it's sort of an interesting discussion from the SEO driven, the, you know, Mahalo, Ehow, you know, Wikipedia era of content to this new era, the BuzzFeed-ish era or Upworthy era where social is the driver. And I guess I, I just named two of them. So uh, it's very difficult for me to speak sp uh, specifically about certain sites because yeah. I'd, break, I'd break privacy things and oh, can't okay. do that. Um, what I can say is, well, there's, there's one thing I do. So if you, if you go to chartbeat.com slash publishing slash demo, hey, pull then you that can up. see, yep. uh, yeah, I, actually, I sent it as a link, uh, okay. chartbeat.com slash publishing slash demo. Then what you can see is you can see Gizmodo's traffic right now. Uh, Nick Denton lets us, uh, lets us share this. Great. And what you're seeing, and what you're seeing here is a tremendous amount of social traffic coming through. I mean, if I look at Facebook alone, yeah. uh, from their various things, they're, they're showing more than like, close to like 4,000 uh, concurrent, simultaneous people on the site coming from Facebook versus Google's 744. So in part, the answer is, is everyone. You've seen the kind of, the, the, the content farms that were purely search focused, um, had great difficulty. I mean, uh, we've seen demand media, as, as, you, as you know, kind of go through some, go through many of these challenges. Yeah. And everyone knows that, like, as a source of acquisition of new visitors, social is something which uh, they feel they can affect. Uh, and so everyone's going for it. There's not a single site out there that doesn't have some kind of social strategy or isn't saying, you know what, my, two, my three big focuses, and you'll hear this again and again, is like social, mobile, video. Those are the three things that everyone's talking about. And so search and optimization would be maybe number four on people's priority list. In your yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's important, but it feels like, I mean, as I said, like Danny's been uh, talking about this for 18 years now. Yeah. Uh, this is something where people feel like they've built up uh, a certain amount of expertise. They're getting, they know how to get their sites done right. There are people out there they can bring in to do that kind of thing. And it's still, by the way, a lot of work to get done right. But... Social is still new. It's still a lot, uh, confusing to a lot of people. They're seeing people like Upworthy grow yeah. in incredible amounts, and they say, I want me a piece of that. Ah, gotcha. Danny, what's this impact going to have on the long-term business of Google? One would say, if all these new publishers and all these new content sites you know, put optimizing for Google as their you know, whatever fourth or fifth most important thing and optimizing for social as their top, and video, obviously, YouTube, so you know, they're in there a little bit, what does that say for Google's future? Um, I think Google's future is just fine. I, I think that it's really easy to, first of all, get lost between the percentage of traffic that you're receiving from different sources and overlook the sheer volume of traffic that you're receiving. Right. So Gizmodo probably has not seen its Google traffic drop. And, and in fact, most publishers, when you start to get into it and they talk about how socials are like outweighing Google, you know, search or whatever, when you start to talk to them, they don't say that, that search went away. They say what's happened is they've encamped an entire new audience they didn't have before off of social. Ah. So yep, it's, it's as if the pie has gotten bigger, right? Right. So you, you had a little small pie. Now the pie is this big. The Google slice of the pie used to be 50%. Now it's you know 10% or whatever. But it's 10% of a much larger pie. So you know I, I think... You know, first of all, that search continues to send a lot of people a lot of traffic, and it's still valuable traffic. The Gizmodo numbers actually, I find dramatically shocking that that's as little traffic as they're. I'm I'm both simultaneously impressed and wish I had that kind of Facebook traffic that they get, and I also think that's all you're getting off of Google because you ought to be getting a lot more. I would expect so. Well, but that's concurrent, there's, there's, right? I mean, that's like. That's con but there's, then there's also one other thing uh, yeah. to remember now, which is uh, that. 
with Google having moved uh, to HTTPS for, for a lot of its searches, with those kind of searches, they don't send the, uh, ref the ref there's no refer information in the header. That means that when it comes to analytic services, whether it's, whether it's us or anyone else, we can't tell that that's uh, definitively Google. Uh, at that point in time. So there may well be more Google traffic coming in that is hidden to a certain degree. Why do you t in, well, well, even at yeah. HTTP, But even at HTTPS, you should still know it's Google. You just shouldn't know whether or not it was Google. And you should actually be able to tell if it was Google search or not. What they're doing when you go to secure is they're just stripping out the search terms. Yeah. So why did they um, make that change, Danny? Because that really infuriated the SEO community, it seemed, from just following it on Twitter, that people were like, why are you taking away our refers? This is like our lifeblood. This makes our lives impossible. Why did Google do that? Well, you know, they said that they were doing it for privacy reasons at first, which would have made sense if they had done it for privacy reasons and they had stopped continuing to send the referrers off of paid search as well, but they didn't, ah. which they just changed. I mean, it took them two, just a little over two years, but they've just made the same change to kind of close out the hypocrisy that they had there. So that ah. kind of brings it back to, well, they did it for privacy reasons. Hmm. Um, that they, And there is a legitimate concern. If, if somebody can intercept all the searches that you're doing, they can build up a profile of your searches, right? right. You know? Well, which so is what Google's to, doing. Well, right, but you know, Google would never do that for evil, so. Right, okay. exactly, we can trust them. <laughs> <laughs> so by going to secure search, they make it harder for people to do the eavesdropping. They make it even harder by not, but, and they could have gone to secure search and still sent the stuff out to the individual sites, but they went one step further and they not just only went to refer secure search, but they literally stripped out all this, the actual search terms. So all you can tell as a publisher is someone did a search on Google. I don't know what they searched for, but at least they know it's a search. With a few caveats, occasionally you get weird things like IE7 or whatever. You don't get any referrer at all, and, and stuff can change. Yeah. But, all right. but they said they did it for privacy. In, re in, re in related news, uh, related in that it's from the same company but has absolutely nothing to do with their core business, Google has snatched up Titan Aerospace, uh, a company that Facebook was very interested in uh, picking up. We can pull up a picture of one of their drones, a uh, video jockey back there, whoever's working the video. Uh, and... It makes high-altitude drones, this uh, tight, narrow space, and it could be the key for delivering um, internet in hard-to-reach places. There, I guess, is a model. I don't know if they've ever flown that one or not. Producer Gina, let me know. Um, and um, these flying robots also take real-time photos, which is incredibly terrifying, which Google could use for uh, Google Maps. The terms of the deals were not disclosed. Um, and uh, what, do you, what do you gentlemen think of Google getting into the access and drone business, because we have Google Fiber over here, which went from like a test to a rollout plan. I think it's got 40 cities or something to that effect now. And now drones. Is Google gonna just provide internet access for everybody in the coming years, Tony? What do you think? I mean, this is this to me is something that's been a very consistent strategy uh, for them for a very long time, which is to own everything between uh, the person and the actual and, and the search itself and the and the access to Google's information. So they, uh, whether it was, it was Chrome or the Android OS or the Chrome OS uh, or or the uh, the rollout um, uh, of uh, of the fiber, all of these things are based around being able to make sure that no, no one controls what's uh, what's in between them uh, and the user. And so I think for this. The particular kind the, with, the, with the Titan drones, they're really, really good for being able to get internet into kind of hard to find places. So it's just, it's just a consistent part of their strategy. It's, it seems, uh, if, if, if I'm Larry or Sergey, it just seems to make sense. What do you think, Danny? Does it make sense for them to be, you know, working on the last mile of connectivity here and getting fiber to people? Uh, or is this just like, you know, crazy Google boredom with, you know, huge piles of cash? What's their strategy? Uh, I think I think it's probably a, a combination of both. Um, you know, they do seem to do these kind of crazy things, but when they go into an area and they start doing things like fiber, then that puts pressure on the existing players to say, well, maybe we need to step up or do something. Chrome was a good example of that when they launched their browser. It was like, well, we're going to do this because we want to raise up the rest of the browser industry. So, you know, the did the that actually work also, when they did that with the browser? Did that make you know, Safari, Firefox, and Internet Explorer better, or did it just catalyze the whole industry to go more aggressively into like speed and caching and all those features? 
You know, I, I think it probably helped things a little bit. Um, it's hard for me to say. It, it certainly helped me in switching to Chrome. Yeah, which is a <laughs> you know, phenomenally I mean, I better product, Fire right? Yeah. But I, you know, I used to use Firefox, which I had switched off of from Internet Explorer, and then Chrome just eventually felt like the better product for me to use. So, you know, not everybody's going to be the same way, but that's, you know, supposedly that's one of the reasons why they, they would do that sort of thing. But so, you know, it's, it's hard to see how they expect drones are going to cause the step up other people. Yeah. But you can see them doing drones to perhaps do the, the Internet connectivity, although I still find that wacky because there, there's so much effort. Like, we got to go this, everybody who doesn't have Internet, and it's like, I have one Internet provider, and I'm in the middle of suburban Orange County, right? Yeah. So bring me some of the high-speed fiber. I would love it. But um, How much the, would you drone, pay for high, I mean, listen, you... You've done pretty well for yourself in your life, but how much do you think, like, you know, somebody living in rural Orange County would pay to get fiber installed? If they had to pay, like, an upfront fee to help subsidize it, what would you pay? What would other people pay, do you think? I don't know. I, I mean, I, have, I, I haven't even thought of it in that regard. 1000 uh, Yeah, maybe 1000 If I were, especially if I were going to be able to, to do it over time and I was going to do it yeah. as part of a contract type of thing, but... It would have to be really super fast. I mean, I just, you yeah, know, fiber is. the speed I have at the moment... It's pretty good, it, yeah. but my, my choice is one provider. 20 megabits or so, something. And yeah. You, yeah, cable modem standard kind of stuff. But I, I think the drones might also be useful for some of the, um, the mapping that they do already. Yeah. You can imagine that if they can get their permission to fly the drone. I mean, there's places where they'd like to have mapping that they can't get satellites in there where they could fly drones, no problem, or places if they get permission in the U.S. to just start flying them around. I mean... Do you think maybe we should start flying them down the street? We don't need to have yeah. people driving street view cars. What about the issue of now they have your Chrome behavior? They've got, they've got your Gmail behavior, and they just said that when you email into Gmail, we're going to read that email as well. So they're obviously reading and collecting information that's in the Gmail box. They're obviously collecting browser data, search history. Mm -hmm. And if they have fiber, are they going to be listening to the line? And if they provide free Wi Fi everywhere, I mean, how much of the information from these connections do you think will go into the ad network, Tony? And does that concern you as an individual or person in the industry? I know they, they already have so much uh, at this point. It feels like it's, it's the kind of the, the law of diminishing returns in terms of advertising effectiveness. Like once, once you've got past the, the few key factors of the, about a person, you've been able to do a tremendous amount of the targeting and everything else after that provides a, a certain level of diminishing returns. So, uh, if they are already reading my email, they already see every search that I do, every map that, that I check, and they're also running the, the OS on my phone. The, the additional information they get from the fiber and everything else, I don't know if it, if it gives them a tremendous amount more uh, to be able to increase the value of the advertising they target at me. All right, when we get back from commercial break, we'll do our Bing launch of the week, and we have some really interesting stuff in there. Uh, and let me just take a moment to thank our friends at Sharefile by Citrix uh, for making a really great product. We use it here at uh, This Week in Startups and launch to share files with our partners, and you get really granular controls, just amazing um, Amazing things like email alerts and who can download and when they've downloaded, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can share huge video files, which is very important for us. Go ahead and visit sharefile.com and click on the radio microphone button using the code TWIST. Uh, also, if you do sign up now and there's no credit card required and you get a free 30-day trial, so nothing to lose there, um, you can get our exclusive sharefile, sharefile video, the top 10 questions answered and asked uh, to investors on this program. That includes David Cohen, Joanne Wilson, Dave McClure, Steve Jervis, and Brad Fell, Mark Suster, and a couple of others. Go ahead and sign up for ShareFile using the offer code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, and then send us a request to ShareFile at launch.co. So you sign up using the code TWIST, and then you go to request a file, which is right in the menu, and you uh, request a file to ShareFile at launch.co, and we will send you the video, only available through uh, ShareFile. Okay, let's do the Bing launch of the week. Bing, bing, bing. Speaking of bing. Okay, everybody. Uh, so we have three uh, launches, and I'll ask my guests to tell me what they think of each. PlayStation 4 has added a video editor and share feature. You can edit clips, add music, and commentary tracks. Uh, this is meant to deter startup. Is this possibly meant to deter startups like Twitch TV and others that do video game streaming commentary? Uh, pretty interesting product. Let's see a clip.
Wow, it's a pretty, pretty complete video editor there. You got all the frames, and you cut, pick time, and add commentary, of course. Pretty super clever, because doing this, you know, with a computer um, is a lot of work. We actually did that here for a long time at this weekend uh, at Mahalo doing videos. Um, next up, a rolling printer nearing $400,000 on Kickstarter. Let's play that clip. Started working on this project at our college, JCT, at the Friedberg Entrepreneurship Challenge. We received initial funding and the help and guidance of the college's professors in order to work on this. We've been working hard and we built several prototypes for the robot and we have our design for manufacturing prototype all designed out. Now we need your support so we can start ordering and working on the smaller and stronger custom made parts in order to make this robot even smaller and make this incredible device a reality. Thank you for your support. Okay, that's absolutely mind blowing. And then finally, a college kid has hacked into Siri to basically make it open and like have its own API. Let's see a clip of that. Googleplex, turn on the lights. Google Flex, play on top of the world. Okay, there you have it. So I uh, cracked open Siri. Danny, uh, take me through these three uh, startups and, uh, and launches this week. What did you think of the um, college kid who hacked into Siri and the value of that? I, I couldn't see the videos. Oh, but, sorry. But I, but I, that's all right. But I've been reading the the things about them. Okay. So um, the the idea of Siri sounds pretty cool. You know, making it change and do things. But my understanding is, at any point, Apple might change all that around, and it kind of makes you go through Safari. I'm, I'm looking at an Engadget write up on it, and so nice idea, but in reality, probably not good. And what? oh, terrible name, because you know Google's just going to sue you over that. Why? Why? <laughs> um, why just a question. Why isn't Siri uh, open with an API so that you could build links into it, and do you think it ever will be? Um, I think that the Cortana stuff might put some pressure on Microsoft to do, and not on Apple to do that, because it's it, Cortana is specifically designed to let people tap into it if you want to. Yeah. So, but I suspect that it's closed because it's Apple, and Apple likes to do things very carefully and only let stuff work the way that they want to do it, and possibly only let things work the way they wanted to do it if there's a good business revenue model behind it as well. So mm. ideally, you ought to be able to say to Siri, hey, I want to change my search default to Google. I want my local search results not to come from Yelp, but to come from being local yeah. and, and have it wired up however you want. But Okay, Tony, what did you think of this uh, Siri hack? And uh, do you use even use Siri or any of these things? So I don't use Siri anymore. I was, <clears throat> it's the reason I got my 4S when I, uh, when I got it. I was obsessed with it for an entire day and then <laughs> got... got Got too frustrated with it actually kind of not really working. What's interesting for me is like as Danny says, I mean this is this is a this is a thing that was kind of hacked together. Uh, you have to go through Safari. There's delays and there's all these kind of challenges with it, uh, which makes you kind of question it in some ways. But then I remember um, that GroupMe uh, was a hack at a, te a TechCrunch hackathon, and uh, then went on to sell for something like eighty million dollars. And that was basically just built on top of the the Twilio API. So. Yeah, this is a hack. Yeah, it's kind of kind of buggy now, and it's based on someone else's platform. But that hasn't stopped other people from having great success in the past. Yeah, I mean, I love it. Four freshmen from Penn. Well done. I want to I want to meet those uh, that team. Jeez, yeah. they, they need to get. I, I mean, I need to angel invest in them. For whatever their next idea is, I don't think I even need to know it. All right, next up is the um, rolling printer. What did you think of that one, Tony? And uh, by the way, we can play this in the background if you wanted to while they're talking or something. What do you think of no, the rolling I, printer? Yeah. So it. It's 
freaking badass, dude. I mean, look at this thing. It's amazing. Uh, the, the interesting thing for me was that they've got this beautiful design and they've got the product that actually works. And these two things are completely different right now. Yeah. Um, uh, but if they, can, if they can make it happen, then it's going to be an absolutely beautiful piece of kit. I don't know how much utility there is. I don't know how much demand there is out there from the world. But for something which makes you just say that would be a really cool thing to own, mm. uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I loved it too. Danny, what did you think of the printer? Uh, I would love to have seen it in action, but the idea of a portable printer I could take sounds pretty cool to me. I would be far happier if somebody would spend the time just to come up with a regular printer that always worked. Yes. I, I, I cannot tell you the degree, and I even wrote a post once about literally throwing a printer out of my window <laughs> over... I mean, I did it because, you know, it's like every time the kids have something they need to have printed or whatever, it's this nightmare of is it working, is it talking or whatever. And all this technology, all this effort that goes into things, Still. if they can make a printer roll around and print, I, that's nice. But I see a bigger market in make it all better, just printing in general. Please, I'm begging. Okay, finally, um, what, did you, what did you think of the uh, PlayStation 4, Danny? Well, I've got you on the line here. PlayStation um, 4, yeah. I, Video Again, editing. I couldn't see the demo, but, you know, for me personally, I'm like, who cares? Boring. My kids would probably go insane for it. Okay. They, they love that sort of stuff. And, and that's probably the thing that, that resonated the most with me, just knowing how much they, they enjoy things like that and showing yeah. clips. Tony, your thoughts on the uh, making your own videos and movies from your PlayStation so, 4? Uh, so, so here, here's the thing, like, on this, like, more people watched uh, the League of Legends final uh, the, like it was like 31 million people watched that. This is 15 million people uh, for the for the one of the World Series games. I mean, this is like this is an incredibly popular thing for and a way for people to kind of learn how to get better at these things. So I think this is a smart move here. They're doing something which is part of this hugely growing uh, market. I'd be interesting to see what uh, this means for Twitch and for Major League Gaming. Yeah, but it's it's obviously something that PlayStation feel like they should be doing, and it's a smart move to capture that market. So which one was your favorite? Danny. And then which one was your runner-up? Uh, I would say the, um, the, the uh, video game thing and then the rolling printer after that. Okay. And Tony, yours? Your number one? So I think my number one is the printer. And then after that, uh, the hackers doing Siri just because I always like the little guys. Okay. And uh, listen, as far as I'm concerned, the video editing stuff is very clever, but you know, it's been done, and you know, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on the world. The rolling printer is super gorgeous, and just I could see kids loving that. I could see it doing, like, art, and it's, like, sort of on the way to, like, almost nanotechnology. I could see maybe someday you have, like, a collection of, like, five or six of these things on a table. When you say print, it, like, knows the grid on your table, finds the paper, and then just prints something, like a bunch of insects or something. So just crazy, but I love the kids who built the hack because that's what Siri really needs. I mean, Siri, the reason Siri sucks and nobody uses it is because they're not letting the other app developers into Siri to do the hard work for them. Can you imagine if Yelp was connected to Siri and you could say, find you know, Chinese food, open now, over four stars with Peking duck, you know, like. But, but I mean, Yelp is connected with Siri. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. Is it? Oh, because I, I, but it doesn't launch the app, right? It does like a, a, a it, Google it search? No, it should go into the app or at least give you Siri-powered results that are from Yelp. So it, there's a lot of integration like that. Oh, yeah, because that, that, that was a, original? Because I remember that was my personal. No. Oh, okay, so they added that. Yeah, so. They updated it in, one, in iOS 7. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit in there in iOS 6, but it wasn't as good. Yeah. So anyway, that's, I mean, I, I kind of think that this should be put on the app developers. Thank you for the uh, update, Danny, by the way. As opposed well, to, like, they, waiting for Apple. To give you, like with Cortana, one of the things you can do is if you go through and you say, I'm looking for Netflix films or whatever, or I think it's Netflix, it's like uh, that the popcorn film place or whatever. I can't uh, think of it. Metacritic name, or Rotten Tomatoes or. It's something Fandango. like that. But it, it's like a Fandango. It launches the app. And, it, and Facebook the same way. It will launch the Facebook app and it yes, will send you into it. Yes, that's what I so. want. And then to yeah. know what the top 10 features are in those and say, you know, launch, you know, Fandango you know, um, Iron Man 3 or whatever, X-Men, and then get to that page. X-Men Showing Times, you know, we get even more interesting. So I have to, I'm going to, um, as, yeah, I'm going with the college kids. I, I know it's like a silly launch or something like that, but I think it's super important. So you have a split decision there. Thanks to our friends at Bing uh, for being a great long-term partner of the program. Go ahead and try all the great. What's a great 
uh, Bing feature Danny that uh, other search engines don't have? Something they do that's just re they do really well in your estimation because you keep tabs on this. Well, you know, the, the Faircast thing that they were doing, which was to try to predict what's going to go on with future flights, ah. I always thought was very good. Although yeah. it's become hit and miss when I use it now. I'm mm. going to tell me, and it's like, well, we don't have enough information. I'm like, you're useless to me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, the Fair um, one is the Fair estimator is great, yeah. But that, that was definitely a, a good feature that they've had. They've had other things, too, like if you wanted to find images by size for your desktop or whatever. Ah, very um, That was pretty nice. And, in yeah. fact, Google took about two years to catch up with that. So yeah. I love cool. the video previews. That's my favorite is that they cache, yeah. like, these video previews. So when you, if you want to see what's actually in the video, you just hover over it, and it plays, like, the first X number. Yeah. And it does it across, like, AOL and YouTube and any other service. So thanks to Bing. All right. Next up um, in my notes here is uh, Hotel Tonight has added um, Get Hotels uh, all next week feature uh, called Look Ahead. Obviously, if you don't haven't used Hotel Tonight, you basically can book a hotel from noon on at a steep discount. So you take the app out at noon, you pick which hotel you want, and you can check in at 4 o'clock. Now they're saying look ahead and see what you th they estimate the availability and price will be. I guess this is to reduce people's anxiety. What do you think of that feature, Tony? Have you ever used Hotel Tonight? Uh, I haven't. I, it's kind of interesting uh, to me from a kind of strategy perspective of, so I wonder how much of this is driven by the desire to kind of increase the potential market, the, to, to in, increase that side of things. And my challenge with always these things is when moving away from that kind of core initial value proposition uh, and trying to expand, is this something where they're going to start moving towards and just be like another kind of price line or, uh, or kayak down the, down the line? Uh, that's kind of the interesting question that, come, that comes to mind for me. Uh, I haven't used the app personally myself. Yet. Yeah, how about you, Danny? Have you used it? And what do you think of this new feature? And why though? I haven't it? used it, but it's been on my list to install because I, I like the idea that um, I can get that kind of thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's really common, especially if I've got to fly up to San Francisco from Orange County, and then I'm, it's like 9 o'clock. I'm like, am I going to make my last flight, or maybe I should just stay over? I, I want to fire up something like that to find um, uh, you know, a quick hotel at a good price. Five times I've used it, at least, maybe 10. Uh, it's a great product. I used it. I got the Ace Hotel a couple of times. In fact, a lot of times I'll just, you know, San Francisco or whatever, if I don't have points in Starwood, I just use it because I know I'm going to get a great rate. Um, and I've never, I was disappointed one time because, uh, and I talked about it on the program, they, they sort of have like a little bit of their, they are um, subject to sort of surge-ish surge pricing. If Palo Alto is packed, you might pay, and I did pay, like two or three, maybe 300 bucks for a hotel that was not so great. Um, and I think they oversold a little bit. Like, I, if I paid $100 for that hotel, I would have felt fine. But paying 300 I was comparing it to, mm. you know, staying at the Ritz or something or something better. But look ahead. Uh, we'll show you when there's a conference in that city and those kind of things. So they're, they're doing a better job with that. Finally, YouTube is promoting its YouTube stars. Uh, Susan Wojcicki has taken over, and she is making her imprint felt very early. If you follow her on Twitter, pull up her Twitter handle, by the way. A video jockey out there. I'm not sure who's running the video, Gina. But uh, pull up Susan Wojcicki's Twitter handle, and you'll see she's meeting with every partner. She's tweeting, and she is really, really getting engaged with the community. Um, I know this. Um, and they are going to do uh, a very specific uh, project here where they're having their YouTube stars, the biggest stars in the system, um, I think including Michelle Pham, and they're going to do TV spots with them and billboards and that kind of stuff. And her thinking was, if we're going to sell premium ads, we have to think about ourselves being up against television, and television does upfronts, and they sell in advance, and they market the heck out of these shows to bring audience in, and I think also to make advertisers feel um, you know, more interested. What do you think of this move, Danny? Uh, I think it's smart. Um, I was watching the Mad Men premiere and in you know they do the commercials and one of the commercials was one of these things to say hey meet a youtube star or whatever which i thought was an effective placement and you know it th there really is this huge audience that turns to youtube and i watch my own kids and they don't make a difference between i want to watch a tv show tonight or i'm going to watch what's on youtube tonight yeah. they'll they, they tune into these shows they love the things that the people at rocket jump do um you know they're you know, it is their television network that they go into it. And so I think it's smart what hey, Google's uh, doing to, to try to put that out there more. Gina, take a look and see if we actually have that video. I'd be interested to see. 
the one um, if they, that they're playing at Mad Men. Uh, Tony, what are your thoughts, and how is video playing into growth and YouTube uh, for publishers? So video, video for everyone in general, and, uh, and YouTube as part of that, is, is huge for publishers, uh, particularly because that's pretty much the only inventory that's re reliably sold out for everyone uh, as they go. That's the thing they have no problem with. This, for me, is very, is very smart, in, in part for not just for kind of building the audiences, but for the advertising perspective, in that when ad sales guys are going to talk to agencies and so forth, they can talk about a TV show, and the agency, even if they haven't seen that TV show, will know what they're talking about, will know something about that show, just because of the amount of advertising that goes on around those shows. When it comes to YouTube things, the people who know, who have their audience there, who know the, those people, that's one set of people. But when you go to the agencies, they're going to be fairly lost unless they're part of that kind of group that, group that knows about kind of Michelle Fan and so forth. And so just for kind of raising the, uh, the level of kind of knowledge and awareness among the people who are kind of making these big advertising spends, this makes a lot of sense. Um, it is um, super interesting because I think it's a direct response to the fact that other players, we saw Kara Swisher write about um, Yahoo screen, I guess, becoming more like YouTube, rumors of Amazon, and obviously tw Twitter hiring Baljeet Singh, who worked over at... Um, uh, YouTube previously, these moves, I think, show pretty clearly that YouTube stars are going to be hired by the AOL Twitters, uh, Facebooks, possibly Amazons, and if YouTube wants to keep them, they're going to need to up their deals, get them higher CPMs, and maybe covet them a little bit, which, you know, being a platform that doesn't pick favorites previously has made it pretty hard for them. Um, this is something that Google doesn't do on the search side. Obviously, Danny, you've seen me fighting with Matt Cutts all the time, and he says, oh, we don't have any partners. We're not allowed to have partners. We don't have partners. We don't give any special consideration to anybody. Nobody gets a special meeting, and everybody gets treated the same. Here we're seeing an example of people getting treated exceptionally well who produce great content. How, how is Google dealing with this sort of dichotomy in their culture, Danny? Poorly? <laughs> <laughs> Explain. I, I think it's the right answer, correct. Ex expand. <laughs> um, I think you make a, a good point. And one of the challenges that they've had with YouTube is they have something that is both a search engine. People do turn to it and search for information on it. And it's also a content destination. And Google, historically, its roots were, we are a search engine that outward points to on to other content destinations. So our conflicts between our our pointing to the best stuff and trying to have the best stuff were, were not an issue. But now they want to have the best stuff. They want to be a content destination very much, and they want people to come to them. And so you will have the search side trying to desperately say, well, we don't do any kind of favoritism. We don't do any kind of things like going on like that. And yet you're going to have stuff happening at YouTube, which still remains a search engine as well, where they're going to be deliberately trying to promote some of their good stuff that's out there. Um, you see similar things with Google Plus, where they will talk about certain Google Plus accounts because they want to promote those kinds of Google Plus accounts to have track people to the network. So um, I think they deal with it poorly because I don't think that they tend to address the conflict that they have to begin with. I think they address I think they address with it well in the sense that by and large web search really doesn't try to play these favorites. But I don't think they really understand the degree that I think people are starting to shift to feel like yeah, you're just going to do whatever you want for yourselves. Um, and they do, by the way, in search, have partnerships and special deals and all that sort of stuff that you want to talk about. They do have all that stuff. What are they? What would you say some of the top like special deals are that you know the Justice Department or competitors or other people would point out and say, like, this doesn't feel fair? Is it Whale Shark Media it, it, one of those, the coupon one where the they invested no, a ton of money? Be, it wouldn't be like that. It would be more that if they're going to deal with a large news publisher and they're having issues getting the news publisher's content into Google News, they're probably going to talk to them. They may set up some, yeah. some way to deal with it because they want that kind of content. So they will go after that sort of stuff. That's different from, and we're going to make sure that the news publisher comes yeah. up number one or whatever. But um, I think that <laughs> my opinion of the 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 antitrust investigation agencies and the government agencies yep. and everything that have looked into Google is so incredibly low because I find them incredibly stupid that it's, it's, that's about all I can say on it. They don't, they spent and basically wasted all the time and energy that they had chasing down whether or not Google was being unfair to its competing search engines as if that was what you were going to spend your political capital on. 
Right. And so, you what know, should they have the spent end, their time on? If you what they should have spent their time yeah. on was looking at whether or not Google has too much of a closed loop. Right. Is it an unfair advantage that you have a service that can gather up all this data that in turn helps them understand which content on the web really should rank better in mm -hmm. a way that somebody who doesn't give away a lot of other this stuff or doesn't have all these yeah. products and services can do. Does it make sense that if you are a search engine that you should be not favoring your own search results because that's stupid. That's like saying it's unfair that the New York Times favors its own sports section. Right. But whether or not you should be putting links into your own destination content, right. which it would be your YouTube or whatever, that sort of stuff. And, and are there things that are going on there? And, but it, it really is that closed loop thing that I think was the bigger issue. If Google's got all this Google Analytics data flowing in and they've got yeah. Google Fiber and they've got all this stuff, nothing segregates all those things from going into one big giant pool to figure out this is the best of the stuff that's out there. Tony, how do publishers look at Google today given you know, the sort of dichotomy of we're going to pick favorites on YouTube side, we're going to pick favorites on Google Plus and have a suggested user list and feature stuff, but then on search, we're going to be this black box and claim that everybody has a fair shake and then do, you know, penguin updates, panda updates, not explain what's going on and just decimate certain businesses, other ones survive and, you know, all the sort of backroom dealing that may or may not be occurring. How do publishers look at Google today? Do they trust them? With, with a certain amount of fear. I mean, you just actually saw um, in this last week, uh, the CEO, I believe it was of Axel Springer, which is one of the large uh, publishers in Germany, write an open letter uh, to Eric Schmidt. Uh, Let's pull that letter about, up, by the way, uh, video jockey, please. Go ahead. Uh, talking about the, ch the challenges and, the, and the, the fear of Google having far too much power in, the, in, in this space and being able to be a, a kind of kingmaker in, in this regard. So uh, I think, obviously, you have... You have a range of, of, of emotions among publishers, uh, but they're very much aware, uh, and it's not just Google. I think they, they look at they look at the the changes that Facebook and that uh, and that Twitter can drive as well. That uh, uh, you can you can see their fortunes, their traffic change dramatically uh, with an algorithm change. So naturally, when you're when you, when you live by the platform, you have a tendency to die by the platform too. And is part of chart beats value proposition to publishers that you're not Google's analytic product that's going to take all, you know, Google Analytics, then Google gets a license to all your data. They have all this insight into your site. Are publishers saying, like, I'm not going to let Google in the hen house. I'm not going to let Google analytics into my place. I'll just use other, you know, Omniture and then, you know, whatever, real time with you guys at Chartbeat. I mean, is that a sales uh, technique or do people bring that up in the sales meetings? Uh, not in about four years, to be honest. Uh, oh. They either they either have Google Analytics, or more commonly, they'll have something like Omniture uh, or Core Metrics, and so forth. Uh, they they tend to use us for a very different purpose. We're kind of on the front lines with their teams, whether it's like in editorial or video production or ad sales. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's 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 never become a, a real selling point. Let's see uh, this YouTube Star commercial uh, that Danny referenced. If we could cue that up. Well, uh, we seem to have found it. Here we go. I'm Michelle Vaughn. I just wanted to show every girl out there how beautiful she was. Makeup gives you the chance to express yourself, create any masterpiece you want or you can dream of, and become any person you want to be. Yeah, that's pretty brilliant. I love that that ad. What'd you got? What'd you think, Tony? Uh, I couldn't actually see it, oh, uh, but sorry. it sounded great. <laughs> Yeah, we have to get that loop. Uh, that would be one of our long-term things. Maybe year six we'll get the uh, video feed going. It's a little complicated to do that. Um, all right, you wrote a great piece. We'll wrap with this. Uh, why a lot of clicks don't always equal great content. Uh, and I think you posted this to time.com. Interesting choice of where to uh, publish it. Myth one, clicks equal attention. Myth two, we share what we read. Myth three, native ads work. Myth four, banner ads don't work. Let's go through each of these. And I would like Danny to uh, maybe respond to them. I'm, I'm hoping, Danny, you've seen the piece. So. Uh, explain myth one clicks equal attention. So we've we've been assuming for the longest time, and particularly like the the key uh, metric for content has been page views uh, for the last twenty years or so, and we've been assuming that what people click on they read, uh, or at least that's been the the, the function of uh, what we do. But of course, the page view is not a, uh, a measurement of content at all. It's a measure of the link to that content. And once I've clicked on that link. 
whether I read or not, whether I like it or low, that has no impact on, on that metric. And as a result, one of the surprising things when you, when you uh, start to look between the clicks, and one of the things that Chartbeat does is we measure second by second, pixel by pixel, uh, the behavior and what's actually happening on, uh, on a website, is you see that one a dramatic percentage uh, of of people who click on a page aren't then subsequently reading. You see on a standard page, about 55% of people um, will, uh, will not make it past the first 15 seconds on a page. For, for an actual content page, it's slightly better. That's about 70%. But also, a lot of the things that we've learned about this in terms of you know, the, the evergreen topics that drive clicks don't necessarily drive people actually reading. So we've seen all the headlines with kind of biggest and richest and fictional, all the kind of keywords that we know are going to kind of get someone to click. What you find, though, is that whilst they get a tremendous amount of clicks, they also get very, very low attention. People tend to bail very swiftly after that. Ah. Whereas when you look at uh, other topics, and particularly you look at kind of news topics, whether it's Woody Allen or Obamacare uh, or Zimmerman, uh, these things people would not just click on, but they read. And it's actually quite an, it's quite an important and good story that good content uh, and interesting content will actually get read, and it's not really so much about tricking people as it is about creating good stuff. Danny, what are your thoughts on that uh, insight? I like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it... Um, is it in, in true or...? <laughs> well, I mean, it's an insight based on the data they have. I mean, the, the you know, stuff that is link baity. I guess the, the, the headline is link baiting stuff uh, gets clicked on more people spend less time on it. Yeah, I mean, to, get, to give you a sense of this, we looked at a random sample of about 2 billion page views across 580,000 articles on 2,000 sites. Uh, and we were looking at kind of like most clicked on topics uh, across the board, and then we managed to, uh, then we contrasted the most clicked on that were actually read with the most clicked on that weren't read. And the, the data was pretty clear on, uh, on kind of what works and what doesn't here. Great. And I mean, I, I, can, I can say, you know, from the perspective of a small publisher, we, we can have things that, we will think about headlines as much as anybody else and we will want to attract the click, but we don't ourselves specialize in the sort of, and I don't want to say clickbait, but we don't, you know, we're not a Buzzfeed, we're not an Upworthy and our, our, our publications aren't designed to try to pull people in because we want to just get the page view. We, we are trying to build an audience and I think that, you know, that's actually worked for us, that our, our audience grows up. We don't have that kind of giant rise like you have with an Upworthy, mm -hmm. but we have a really strong business that's been built up because we have an audience that knows that they've got good, solid content that they've, they've come to depend on. And that was one of the things in, in Tony's piece that he talked about, that you want to build up that audience that keeps returning. And, you know, our internal people who come back, when we send out our newsletters, we can see the people coming back in off of that. That is the most important thing to us. It's not that you've read our article, but that you connected with us in some ways so that we can keep sending you. How has this changed yeah. things for advertisers? Because advertising is based on the views, and they don't seem to care about how long somebody's on the page or the quality of the engagement. So, so what does this mean for advertising? So actually, um, this is actually one of the most interesting things. In the one of the challenges that we've had uh, with advertising, the reason why uh, so many people are kind of down on publishing uh, is they say, you know what? There's uh, this is a this, this is a business with kind of sh with shrinking revenues as an industry. Uh, CPMs are, are collapsing and so forth. And actually, and then this speaks to kind of like the the, the kind of fourth myth in in that uh, in that article, which is like certainly if you're dealing in impressions, just standard impressions, then we have a problem because, as I said, they're, they're generated by the click on the link before you even get to the content. So there's, whether you created great content or not makes a uh, little difference to that particular moment in time. Uh, and also, they're effectively something of infinite inventory. And whilst you have infinite inventory and a marginal cost of near zero to create more, your prices are always going to track towards zero. What's interesting, though, is when you sort of look at attention, First, that attention, the amount of time that someone spends with that ad in front of their face, is actually one of the, uh, uh, of the two key things that suggest recall and recognition. The other one is the quality of creative. Huh. So if you're actually holding someone's attention uh, in front of an ad for a longer period of time, they have a greater likelihood of, being a, a, of recalling, of recognizing that ad, which is actually what brands want. Brand advertisers want people's uh, time and attention so they can communicate their message. So why don't we just measure that? And so, Danny, what do, you, what do you think of that? And is this why we have, like, medium.com is really, like, telling people how long this 
you know, read is going to be and trying to, they seem to be trying to optimize to get people to spend more time on the page. Is this a trend? You know, I, I mean, I, I, we had our own article recently where somebody talked about all the trends and this is how long it's going to take you to read. And then, in fact, if you tell people how long it's going to take, that they may be more inclined to actually click through and do the read because they know what to invest on it. But huh. I don't know. I, I think one of the challenges that we face is there's just not a lot of time and there's a lot of things competing for our attention. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that because I told you this will take you 20 minutes that that's going to necessarily mean that, okay, now I'm going to devote the 20 minutes or whatever. I, mm -hmm. I, I think the answer is you do a variety of things that you have to understand that you're going to have an audience that is not going to spend. I'm, <laughs> I saw Upworthy did this thing that made me click through and it was like, you've got to make time to do this. And so I clicked through and it was like the Harrison Ford thing that he was doing. He was like, you've got to devote an hour to do this. I'm like, I'm what what our planet are you on? I'm at work right now. I'm not going to set aside an hour to do this right now. So if there was something you really thought I should know, you had to figure out on the one hand, maybe there was something you could communicate to me in a much shorter period. And in another is, platform, in another way, I may want to spend that hour when I've got the hour to spend in another format. But this, um, is, this is the kind of, this is the wonderful thing, though. This is the, uh, this is the important thing. And Dan, you said it yourself. It's like, it's the, the scarcity of that time that's so valuable. If you're actually able to get time from someone, which is a zero-sum metric, if they're spending five minutes on search engine and they're not spending five minutes elsewhere, that's a unit of scarcity. And if we're going to have mm -hmm. premium advertising on the web, if we're going to build a quality audience on the web and be able to monetize that, then we need to be dealing in units of scarcity, not units of abundance. And so your ability to hold someone for five minutes, when, the, when you have to compete with the entire sum of human knowledge and every major entertainment form on earth to hold them for five minutes, that's pretty damn amazing. And we should value that. How do we, com how do we, I, I how do we communicate that to the advertisers, Danny? Well, I, I think it depends on the publication. Like, you know, our I don't even know our CPM rates offhand because I don't have to deal with it, but I know that they're really $50, I'm really, sure. They're high in the sense that I know that we have a sales team that will go and when they're talking to somebody say, and work with the people who are advertising to say, you're going to get conversions off of this. That it's not about we're just you're showing a bunch of ads. We we want you to be getting conversions off of this. We think you're going to get conversions off of this because we have a very small, very targeted audience. That's exactly what you know should measure up with what you're doing. And so I think that publishers, I don't know that they can get away from necessarily the CPM aspect of it, but it it is this sort of ultimately for the advertiser. Did this convert in a way that you can tell? Some advertisers they don't care. For yeah. them. Just getting the buzz is going to be enough. That's, that's sort of your Super Bowl type of thing. I was just getting people talking about it, and I'll get magical lift, and everything will be great. But I think a lot more advertisers have become sophisticated and will understand that, no, we need, to, we need to know we're getting the right audience, and we need to have a way to measure that we actually got the right audience in some way that this did pay off for us. And, yeah. you know, hopefully, I think one of the things that would help is if you have ad reps who are more experienced and understand and, and more thoughtful placing of advertising because you get some some people who are just like I just want to buy a bunch of traffic and I want to buy it from these big places because somebody above me said get it from all these big places and then nobody's actually doing the analysis with advertising that they probably need to do. Tony is there a new metric that will come at some point in the internet industry that is you know engagement level uh, on these ads? Because we don't really track how long people are on the page and give that back to advertisers, do we? And do we sell that? I've never seen anybody sell. I'm going to give you the people who have five or 10 or a minute at a different price on the page. So actually, that's something that's starting to happen right now. This is one of the kind of interesting things. So one of the things that, uh, that we're actually doing is we're actually able to track uh, down to the ad placement, the amount of actual attention in terms of were you looking at the screen? Did you spend like 10 seconds with this ad in, uh, ad in front of you? Or did you spend 20 seconds with this ad in front of you? Did you stop, turn away for a few, uh, for a few minutes and come back to it? And, we can, and what's that, uh, what that actually shows you actually is a very different view of the page as well. It tells you that maybe that top leaderboard ad, to, um, to Danny's point about people who are just like grabbing old kind of heuristics of this guy told me to get the top leaderboard, I should just get that ad. Um, instead, what it tells you is that when you're looking at the data, you can find other ad placements that have much, much more attention, that are much more valuable in terms of, in terms of user goals. And you're seeing people out there who are actually starting to, to sell on this and starting to think about it interesting. Now, it's, a, it's early days because uh, this is an industry that is based on inertia, uh, let's mm. face it. Yeah. But it's something where we can, if we understand what a brand's goals are, 
Uh, and if it's not direct response, if it's not a straight conversion, if it is recall and recognition, and, you know, like no one is no one is clicking on a Miller Lite ad to buy beer. Like that's just not happening. Um, then being able to understand the amount of attention is actually a valuable thing. And now people are doing that. All right, listen, this has been an amazing program. Thank you so much to Danny Sullivan for joining us. Everybody check out Search Engine Land, uh, and you can follow Danny Sullivan, uh, at Danny Sullivan on Twitter. And what's the Twitter handle for Search Engine Land? Uh, it's S Engine Land. Uh, sorry, S Engine Land, and there's also Marketing Land, which is easier because that's just slash Marketing Land. Perfect. Um, so go ahead and follow those accounts. And any plugs, Danny? You got anything coming up? You got a show? Because I know your shows are legendary and awesome and informative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have our uh, SMX Advanced Conference, which is sort of our SMX our top Advanced. Right. That happens in Seattle in June, and that's the one that sells out every year. So if you're thinking about that, book a ticket soon. All right. So uh, wait a second. Martech. What, what if, I, if I go to SMX, what am I going to learn? If you go to SMX, what do you learn? You're going to learn about everything you need to know about search marketing. <laughs> Got it. And, oh, and <laughs> How oh, to get this? all that search traffic. <laughs> Google's Matt's Cuts is doing a, a Q&A keynote. So yep. that means I should come, and I should do the keynote after him, since he did the keynote after <laughs> me at the last one, and we can mix it up again. If you really uh, want to get traffic. Of, he's, he's the end of the day one there, but that's actually a fun one to do because it is, it's sort of like the one where I really press him on all the stuff that's come up over the past year. And it's not him just, I'm on my own and I'll just say whatever I want to say. And it, I, it, it's a lot of fun. You do a great job with him and he's, you know, he's very loyal to you because he's always very honest. And I, I've been, just so people know, I've been giving Matt Cutts a real hard time since what he, you know, he did to, you know, Mahalo and all this stuff. But, um, you know, I do think he's a good guy. I just think that, just they're terrible communicators over there, and they don't really think about their partners in a great way. But I do think he's a great guy. I just think they don't care about partners. But, you know, that's just me. Um, hey, listen, uh, Tony Hal, great job on the program. Again, we've got to have you on for a roundtable because you are well-informed and have a lot of data, mm -hmm. and I love that. Uh, what, what do you got, Tony? You got any uh, plugs? Can I plug something besides chartbeat.com? Um, just chartbeat.com is, uh, especially if you guys care about uh, kind of quality more than clicks, chartbeat is the place to go. Also, we're going to be at the International Journalism Festival in Perugia. Uh, we're going to be all over Internet Week. We're going to be at the GEN conference in Barcelona. So if you're more international people, come check us out there. And uh, any jobs? I, and if I wanted to work at Chartbeat, uh, do I go to chartbeat.com slash jobs, maybe? Chartbeat.com slash jobs. Uh, we're, we're always looking for engineers, for great, uh, for great product people, for great salespeople and marketers. Uh, we're growing fast, and we, and we like great people. And uh, you are A-R-C-T-I-C -C Tony on, uh, on Twitter. Yeah, Arctic had, Tony. What was that, uh, Danny? You had some. I was just going to say Chartbeat's awesome. It's, you know, it's, it's, my two tabs are always up there and always running. It's one of the first things I load, and it's always on my desktop. So I, I am loving it. Like you should check it out. I am addicted to Chartbeat. I always have been, and um, it was a big part of Mahalo's success, and it's becoming a big part of inside success because we, we always learn stuff in real time, and then we can react to it very quickly. Um, for example, um, we, we cha we're changing something with our page design because we did a bunch of different tweets, and we found that if we have, like, more short summaries underneath the original short summary, you know, it uh, it drives longer engagement, you know, which your which your product tells you really clearly. And so we're actually changing product design based on Sharpie. And I keep it up awesome. uh, as well all day long. Great product. Um, listen, thanks uh, to everybody who works on the program. Uh, new guy Jacob is here. He's doing a great job. Producer Gina crushing it. Andrew from the launch ticker. Uh, Jade and Emily are crushing it on our events, including Launch Beacon, uh, which will be our New York event on June 16. We're going to talk about location and retail uh, and commerce. It's going to be a great one-day event. It's going to be awesome. Uh, thanks, Demont, for putting the lights on, and Luke and Brandon. Of special note, uh, leaving us this week, Brandis, who has been by our side, making sure that the technology and the audio, the video, and just everything that you consume has been perfect. And she is uh, a model team member, if I've ever seen one, loyal, positive, fun to work with, and just extremely determined to make a better product for the audience. So uh, for everybody here at launch, I just want to say, uh, Brandis, we appreciate your effort, and you've been a delight to work with. And we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And we will be calling you to help work on special projects. We love you, Brandis. And we're going to miss you a whole bunch. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.